So today our mathematician spotlight is Radia Perlman. Um, she's actually by request. So if any of you have a mathematician that you'd like to request, please let me know. I'm very open to suggestions. I, at some point, I think I'll run out of my favorite mathematicians. So um, Radia Perlman um, was uh, did her uh, was a math major in undergrad, and then went and worked for a while, and then came back and did a PhD in computer science, both at MIT. She was at MIT in the 70s when the number of female students there was capped at the size of one dormitory. So that was about 50 students. Um, she invented the spanning tree protocol, which, let's see, this is her in, when she was an MIT student, and this is her more recently. Um, so this is cru crucial to the internet. So she was working in the 70s, and the stuff that she worked on made it possible for the internet as we know it to come into existence. So do it, are any of you familiar with the spending tree protocol? Okay, so um, in case anyone had a better idea of it than me, um, it is a way to efficiently connect networks to each other and also perhaps create some redundancy in case something fails. So that allows networks to work. Um, and she's a, an expert on networks and security because she sort of, invented networks and security, which makes her an expert. And indeed, she wrote the books, one of which she's holding in this picture, um, on networks and security. So she wrote the books on them, she invented them, and she's an expert in them. So that's pretty neat. You could be a math major and then go on to invent whatever is the 40 years later version of the internet that they were inventing back then. Who knows what the next thing will be? So, pretty neat. Okay. So um, last time we talked about using gradients to find the directions of greatest increase or decrease of a function and also to help us find tangent lines and tangent planes to curves and surfaces. And we're sort of, this is sort of the end of that and now we're starting something else. So that's the end of the material that will be on the midterm, which is a week from today. So now we'll start something else. Um, and what we start today is pretty cool. So we're actually going to start optimization. Optimization or finding maxima and minima of a function. So what I'll do today is remind you of how this works in single variable calculus and then push those ideas higher to multi-variable calculus. So optimization means um, finding um, max, maxes and mins of some function. So um, back in single variable calculus, you have some function. Maybe it looks like, um, like this, something like that maybe. So this is your f of x. And you want to find the max, maximum minimum value of f of x. So um, to optimize or find maxima and minima, of f of x. Um, in single variables, what you do is first you find all the critical points. So you set the derivative equal to zero and solve for x. And there might be lots of there might be lots of solutions, maybe like multiple solutions. So geometrically, the insight here is that at a maximum the slope of the function is zero. So here, the slope is zero. And here at this minimum, which is the other point we're looking for, the slope is zero. So that's the idea. Um, also, there are other points where the slope is zero, like here, at this horizontal inflection point, the slope is also zero. So you find critical points, and then you want to know which ones are maxes, which ones are mins, and which ones are neither. So the second thing you do is you classify them as a max, a min, or neither. So, and then um, thirdly, 
Um, by the way, if you happen to be optimizing on a constrained domain, like if I say, I am interested in this function from 0 to 10, you might have to uh, check the boundary points. Because like for this function, this boundary point here was higher than any other point on the function. But it's not a place where the slope is 0. So we might have to check that. So today, we will um, push these things into higher dimensions. And then the next time, we'll talk about if we're on a constrained region and what you do with the boundary. That's the goal. OK. So here's what happens in multi And then you classify them. Um, so here's the idea. Uh, there are a couple of things that might happen. I'm going to draw these as functions of two variables, so it's a surface, so we can draw it. So it might happen that what you have is, locally, your, your function looks something like this. You have a local um, min. Um, and if that's the case, notice um, we have this idea over here that if you have, say, a local min, that the slope is 0. It's true. Over here, notice that if you're walking along the surface in the x direction, whichever direction that might be, maybe it's this direction, if you're walking along it in the x direction, you're going downhill for a while, and then, af and then you start going uphill, and at the critical point, you exactly have slope 0. So at this critical point, the partial derivative with respect to x is 0. Um, also, if you're walking the y direction, whichever direction that is, um, you would be going down for a while and then going up. Um, and as you pass through this critical point, your slope would be 0. So at a local min, both partial derivatives are 0. And another way to think about that is that the tangent plane at this critical point is horizontal. So that's supposed to be the tangent plane that's touching right at this critical point. So just like the tangent line was horizontal over here at a critical point, um, in multivariable calculus, the tangent plane is horizontal at a critical point. Um, another option is locally your function might look like this. So your critical point might be here. It might be a local max. And again, in this case, the partial derivative in the x direction um, will be 0. The partial derivative in the y direction is 0. And the tangent plane is horizontal. OK, so this is a way of picking out when you have a local min and a local max. Um, but just like over in single variable calculus, sometimes something else happens. You could have a local max, you could have a local min, or you could have an inflection point, neither a local min nor a local max. Um, the same thing over here. So we could have something called a saddle point. So here's what it looks like. Um, it's called a saddle point because it looks like a saddle. So um, when you have a, a saddle on a horse, if you go from the horse's head to the horse's tail, the saddle goes up because your back is sort of curved like that. And then if you go from the left side of the horse to the right side of the horse, it's curved down. So that's why this is called a saddle point. It's also the shape of a Pringle. Okay, So if you go in the x direction, maybe that's this direction, um, uh, you're going from down to up. And at this critical point here, um, the partial derivative with respect to x is 0. And then if you walk in the y direction, maybe you're going up and then you're going down when you get to the critical point. But again, right at the critical point, the partial to, to y is 0. And so this is called a saddle point. Um, again, the tangent plane is horizontal. Uh, but something interesting happens, which is a bit hard to draw. I'm going to sketch this in and then try to draw it. The interesting thing is, well, here, the tangent plane was completely above the function. Over here, the tangent plane was completely below the function. But in this case, actually, the tangent plane is a bit above and a bit below the function. So mm, you can, maybe you can see it 
here, and you can see it in the back, um, but on the two sides, yeah, it looks something like that. In the front and the back, it's, you can see it, and then on the left and the right, it's hidden beneath the function. Okay, so the tangent plane is again horizontal, but um, it interacts with the function in a different way. Just like, by the way, over here, the tangent line is all on one, is all above the function. Here, the tangent line is all below the function, and here the tangent line is sometimes above and sometimes below. So same idea. Okay, so that's the idea. So let's try it for an example. So. Um, so find and classify uh, critical points of f of xy is 4x plus 6y minus x squared minus y squared minus 12. Okay, so let's do it. So um, we want to set the Take the partial derivative with respect to x and set it equal to 0, and take the partial derivative with respect to y and set it equal to 0. Um, and by the way, another way of saying this is just to say that the gradient of f is 0. But 0 is 0, it's a multidimensional 0, so it's 0 vector. Okay, so let's do that. So let's compute the gradient of f as a function of x and y. Okay, partial derivative with respect to x. 4 minus 2x, nice. Partial derivative with respect to y, 6 minus 2y. And we want to set this equal to 0. The 0 vector is 0, 0. So if you do this, you can see, OK, in this case, x has to be 2. And then also y has to be 3. So there's just one critical point, 2 comma 3. So f has one critical point. 2 comma 3. Okay, so let's. So this was the first part, finding it, and now let's classify it. Is it a max? Is it a min? Is it neither? Okay, so when you look at this, you might think it's kind of hard to understand. There's a lot of individual pieces here, but it would be easier to understand maybe if we completed the square. We could really tell what was going on. So let's complete the square. So I'm going to write this as, it's always easier, I think, to complete the square when you have a positive um, coefficient of your squared, positive 1 coefficient of your squared. So let's rewrite this as f of xy is negative x squared minus 4x plus something minus y squared minus 6y plus something and then we'll figure out the constants. Okay, so if this is going to be a perfect square term, can you figure out what has to be going here? Yeah, 4, because you take the ha half of this negative 4, which is negative 2, and you square it. You get 4. And then for here, we take half of this negative 6, that gives us negative 3, and we square it, and we get 9. Okay, now we're taking negative 4 minus 9. So that's negative 13. But in fact, our function only has negative 12. So in order to make it equal to our original function, we have to add 1. OK, so now we completed the square. These two things are equal, but they're in an easier way to understand. And now let's just uh, factor them. So x minus 2 squared minus y minus 3 squared plus 1. OK. So if. So this should remind you of something like, it's basically like z is negative x squared minus y squared. It's that kind of thing, shifted over a little bit with some constants. Do you recognize what kind of thing this is? Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's just like a downward facing paraboloid. It's got a parabola thing in one direction and a downward parabola thing in the other direction. So this is a downward facing paraboloid. So it looks like parabola in one direction and parabola in the other direction, and then circular cross sections. 
And so this point here, this 2 comma 3, where it's centered, is the highest point. So 2 comma 3, it's sitting above the x to y plane, this point 2 comma 3, and this point up here is 2 comma 3 comma 1. So you can see it's a max by recognizing that it's a downward paraboloid. Um, another way you can see it's a max is, well, think about, if suppose we plug in 2 comma 3 in for x and y. Then these whole terms will both be 0 plus 1, okay. If you plug in anything other than 2 for x and 3 for y, these terms will be bigger and they're subtracted. So you'll get something less. So the maximum thing you can possibly get is the thing that you get when you pu plug in 2 and 3. So if you plug in um, anything other than uh, 2 comma 3, um, the function value is less than um, the function value at 2, 3. So this tells you um, 2, 3 is a max. So there's two ways to see it, geometrically and then also algebraically. Seeing anything else you plug in, you'll get something smaller. Yeah. Yeah, questions or ideas? So one thing you might be wondering is like, this seems a little bit ad hoc, this complete the square thing. Um, maybe this is not going to work every time. Maybe there could be something more systematic that would work in all the cases. Like for example, back in single variable calculus, we had a second derivative test. We could find our critical points and then we could just plug them into the second derivative test and it would tell us whether it was a max or a min. Maybe there could be something like that for multivariable calculus. And there is, there's a second derivative test. So, let's talk about that. Okay, but before, so before I talk about the multivariable calculus derivative, second derivative test, though, I want to remind you about the single variable calculus second derivative test for two reasons. It may have been a while since you took single variable calculus. For how many of you has it been a while? Yeah, okay, lots of you are raising your hands, okay? And also because it's possible that when you learn the second derivative test, you didn't really understand it. You just were like, oh, I'll just plug this in and then I'll get the answer. And you might not have understood why it worked. So I want to review it just for those reasons. So, so review. Single variable calculus uh, second derivative test. Okay. So, um, so, we have some things that we care about. So f of x, f of x is the function value. So it just tells you, like, if you plug in x, how high do you get, okay? Um, and then it also sometimes helps to think about this in terms of uh, physics. So it, you're thinking about a particle just moving around on the number line. So in that case, uh, this is like the position of the particle. Where is it along the number line? Then we like to think about f prime of x. Um, this is the rate of change of the function value. Um, which, is a, which is a slope. So this is how we usually think of f prime of x, it's the slope. It's how fast the function is changing. And then for our particle, um, this is velocity. And then finally, we take the derivative of that. That's um, the rate of the change, the rate of change well, it's the rate of change of the rate of change of the function value. So let's call it the rate of change of the slope. Um, and in terms of physics, this is acceleration. Okay, so the second derivative test is a test about whether this, the sign of this thing is positive, negative, or zero. So let's think about what it would mean for the second derivative to be positive, negative, or zero. Okay, it's basically a test of concavity. So if you have, suppose your function looks like some part of this. Okay, then the slope 
is increasing. So anywhere you are on here, the slope is increasing. Like here, the slope is going from sort of zero to a small positive number to a big positive number. Definitely increasing. Over here, the slope is also increasing because it's going from a big negative number to a smaller negative number to zero. So along here, the slope is increasing. So it's the if this second derivative is the rate of change of the slope, then it's positive. So here, f double prime of x is positive along this entire thing. And one way people like to remember this is by making it into a plus sign smiley face. So this you can remember it here, but then you should think, oh yeah, my slope is increasing. Slope is increasing all along here. OK, if suppose then that you have a bit of function that looks like some part of this. Here, your slope is decreasing because it's going from like a big positive slope to a small positive slope to a zero slope. That's definitely decreasing. And then zero to a small negative to a big negative, still decreasing. So I'm, I'm talking about like the slope of the tangent lines here. So the slope is decreasing. Um, so f prime of x is negative. Um, and in terms of your particle, your particle would be uh, either decelerating or like speeding up in the negative direction. And then finally, you're, so these are, this is uh, like called concave up. And this is called concave down. And so this second derivative is really measuring concavity. Is your function concave up or is it concave down? Um, but you might have other situations. So for instance, suppose we have some function that's concave down and then it's concave up. Well, I've made that look like the slope is zero there. That's, I don't want to suggest that. So suppose it's concave down and then it's concave up. Let's th think about this point right in between. Um, on the other hand, you might just have a function that is a line. So let's think about what the second derivative should be for these guys. So here, um, the slope is constant. So the rate of change of the slope is zero. So, um, so slope is constant, so it has no rate of change at all. Um, so in this case, f double prime of x is just zero. And then for this curve, over here, let's see. What would you say f double prime is for this part of the curve? <coughs> it's negative, yeah, because it's concave down. It's just like this part of this curve. So it's negative over here. f double prime is negative. And how about for this part? Positive. It's positive, yeah, because it's concave up. So because this is a nice continuous function, if, the, if it was by the intermediate value theorem, because f double prime is negative on the left and positive on the right, at some point in between, it has to be zero. So at this one point right here, f double prime of x equals zero. So we call that an inflection point. OK. So uh, this is just to, to drum in the idea that the second derivative is a measure of concavity. Yeah? OK. Yeah, questions or ideas? Yeah, so, Harsha? So were you talking about the entire curve when you said that uh, f, the second derivative of uh, f of x is zero, or just that point? This one here. The second derivative of, the spect of, of f is zero just at this point. It's, ne it's negative <coughs> this whole part here, and then it's positive this whole part here. And at just one instant, which I've tried to find, but you know, it's only one point, so. Might not be exact, yeah, at one point. And so that was, I was meant, I was trying to sort of color code it. Like f double prime is zero along this whole straight line, but f double prime is only zero at, at the inflection point. Yeah. Um, by contrast, um, f double prime is positive along this entire curve. f double prime is negative along this entire curve. Yeah, good question.
Yeah, other questions or ideas? Press on then to the multivariable second derivative test. Okay. So let's do it. Um, we're going to use, uh, we use, so first, um, find critical points. Uh, so solve the gradient of f at vector x equals 0 for vector x. And then um, we're going to use the Hessian matrix. So the Hessian matrix is partial, second partial with respect to x, partial with the y and then x, partial with respect to x and then y, and partial with respect to y and then y. So have you guys heard this word Hessian before? Maybe in the context of the American Revolutionary War? Do you remember? No one? Yeah, you have? Yeah, what is, the, what are, what is a Hessian? Yeah, who did they help? Do you remember? Did they? Was it? I'm not sure. So it was, they were, they were, yeah, the Hessians were some sort of elite German soldiers that helped the British. I think they helped the British. I think they were the bad guys, in, at least in the context of those of us who survived and continue to live here. Okay, so th that's the Hessians, and that does not have anything to do with this matrix, but maybe it will help you remember. So. This is the Hessian matrix. Great. Um, and here's what you do. So you find the critical points, and then you use the Hessian matrix. So um, for um, a critical point A of F, uh, you compute the Hessian at A. Then it's a matrix of numbers. Um, on the sheet, I say it's two by two, but uh, you can, it can be arbitrarily big. You just continue the pattern. You can imagine how this would go. Um, with um, eigenvalues, um, of, uh, lambda 1 through lambda n. Do you remember eigenvalues? Um, they basically, eigenvalues basically tell you what the function, what the matrix does. So it's telling you, um, like, if your eigenvalues are all positive, it means that your function is sort of expanding, making things bigger. If your eigenvalues are negative, or wait, wait, wait. Well, it, if your eigenvalues are like positive numbers more than one, it means it's expanding things. Positive numbers less than one, it means it's contracting things. And then with a negative sign, it would be flipping them. Um, so it tells you how the matrix is sort of stretching space in the direction of the eigenvectors. Okay, so we're going to use that. Um, so here's the idea. So if all the eigenvectors, eigenvalues, are positive, I'll draw it in two-dimensional case. It means that basically um, in the x, in one direction, you have a uh, upward facing parabola and in another direction you also have an upward facing parabola so it means that a is a local min um, on the other hand if all the eigenvalues are negative um, it means you have like a downward sloping parabola in one direction and a downward sloping parabola in the other direction and so you're Point A is a local max. And finally, two parts. 
Um, if some um, eigenvalues are positive and some are negative, then it basically tells you that there's like in one direction you have a problem going up and in another direction you have a problem going down. And here's your critical point A. So A is neither max nor min. Um, it's, like, it's like a saddle. And finally, if at least one eigenvalue is 0, uh, the test fails. And you have to try something else. Yeah? Does that mean it's not different that just the same test This test fails. So try something else. Try another method. Um, just like sometimes the second derivative test fails in single variable calculus, in particular, like for the function um, y equals x to the fourth, everything comes out zero, but it's basically like a parabola. So you can sort of tell that your zero is a local min, that sort of thing. Okay. So this is how it's done. So let's do it. Um, so by the way, when I said if some eigenvalues are positive and some are negative, I mean like they're all either positive or negative, and there are some that are positive, and there are some that are negative. I don't mean that they can be zero. Okay. So let's try it for the function. So for example, so if you have f of xy, is 4x minus plus 6y minus x squared minus y squared minus 12. Um, we already found it has one critical point, which is 2 comma 3. And let's just use this test to classify it to make sure it comes out the way it did before. So it's our third way of figuring out what's going on. Um, okay. So we know that the partial derivative with respect to x, we found that before it was 4 minus 2x. And the partial derivative with respect to y is 6 minus 2y. So let's compute the Hessian as a function of x and y. OK, so we need the partial derivative of this thing with respect to x for this box. Negative 2, yep. And then the partial of this thing with respect to x, 0. And then these two entries will be the same as long as everything is nice and continuous. And then the partial of this thing with respect to y. Also negative 2. OK. Now, it's possible that this could have had some variables in it. In this case, it doesn't. Um, so uh, the partial of uh, the Hessian, if we evaluate it at 2, 3, is just the same. Negative 2, 0, 0, negative 2. OK. Now, we want to find the eigenvalues. So you might remember that if you have a diagonal matrix, then the eigenvalues are just the diagonal entries. So if you remember that, uh, you know that they are both negative 2. Um, but you might want to know how to find the eigenvalues, just in case you ever have a non-diagonal matrix. So the way that you do it is you solve for you determinant of, you do the same matrix, negative 2, 0, 0, negative 2, but you subtract lambda along the diagonal. And you set that equal to 0. And you solve. So in this case, we would get negative 2 minus lambda times negative 2 minus lambda. The determinant is this times this minus this times this minus 0 equals 0. And so we indeed get that both of the lambdas equals negative 2 with multiplicity 2. So we got that both of the lambdas were negative 2. So let's see. All of our eigenvalues are negative. They're all negative, which means we're in this situation. All the eigenvalues are negative. So locally, our thing looks like a downward paraboloid. It's good. Our thing is a downward paraboloid. So the second derivative test, so both eigenvalues are negative. 
So this tells us that 2, 3 is a max. Yeah, a local max. A local max, which in fact is a global max, which we've determined before. Yeah. Yeah, questions or ideas? Let's um, look at a situation where it might fail. So I did not write this on the sheet, but I know that I have extra time, so I'm gonna write just that one. So, um, find and classify critical points of f of x, y equals Um, x squared, y cubed. How about that? So, to find the critical points. So, the gradient of f, let's see, derivative with respect to x is, I think, 2xy cubed. Derivative with respect to y, 3x squared, y squared. And if you set this equal to 0, 0, I think you get like x could be 0 or y could be 0. Um, or y is 0. So in fact, the entire x-axis is a cr are critical points, x-axis, and the entire y-axis are critical points. So let's pick our favorite critical point. Let's choose um, critical point 0, 0 and classify it. Okay, so we could have picked any point on the, one of the axes, but let's pick zero, zero. Okay, so let's classify it. So let's find the Hessian. Can you see what the Hessian matrix evaluated at zero, zero is going to be? Zero? All zeros, yeah? If I take the partial derivative of this thing with respect to x, I'll get some product of x's and y's. If I take the partials with respect to y, I'll get some pro product of x and y's. Okay, we can just do it, but we're going to get all zeros. So if we take the partial of this thing with respect to x, we get 2y cubed. And with respect to y, we get 6xy squared. This should be the same, 6xy squared. And the partial with respect to y of this thing, 6x squared y. So if you take the partial, the Hessian at 0, 0, you're just going to get 0, 0, 0, 0. OK? So now we want to find the eigenvalues of this matrix. Well, they are all 0. Um, again, it's technically a diagonal matrix because there are zeros everywhere off the diagonal. Um, also. The eigenvalues tell you how a matrix acts, and this matrix acts by just multiplying everything by zero. So, or you could solve for it. So you could solve the determinant of negative lambda zero zero negative lambda equals zero. It would tell you that lambda squared equals zero. So lambda equals zero. So all the eigenvalues are zero. So our test fails because our test depends on things being positive or negative. So the second derivative test fails. So we're going to have to come up with some other way of figuring out what 0, 0 is. So I propose one way here. So. Um, one way to think about a local min, you're a local min if, when you look around, everyone else has a higher function value than you do. On the other hand, you're a local max if, when you look around, everyone else has a lower function value than you do. 
And you're a saddle if, when you look around, some people are higher, or some points are higher, and some points are lower. So let's see if we can find points close to 0, 0 that have higher function values. So first, um, so, so f at 0, 0, if we just plug in 0, we get 0. So are there uh, points near 0 um, with function value greater than 0? And then the other question is, are there points, sorry, this should be 0, 0, near 0, 0 with function values less than 0? OK, so then once we figure this out, we can see whether we're a max or a min or neither. OK, can you find points near 0, 0 whose function value is greater than 0? Yeah, how would you do it? Yeah, 1, 1. In fact, 1, 1 may be not close enough to 0, 0, but anything positive, positive, right? So we could take um, a small positive, any tiny positive number, and a small positive number. Um, f of a small positive number and a small positive number is going to be bigger than 0. So we know there are some places nearby where the function value is bigger. Cool, great. So it might be a local min or it might be a saddle. We're not sure. So it could be a min or a saddle. OK, are there points nearby that have function values less than 0? Yeah, can you think of how to do it? Yeah, f of a small positive and a small negative is going to be less than 0. So there are certainly parts that are lower. So this tells you it could be a max or it could be a saddle. OK, and putting these together, it has to be a saddle. So, so tells you that um, 0, 0 is a saddle point for f. OK. Yeah, questions or ideas? Yeah, Harsha. So that's the only other uh, method we can use is just looking around critical points. Um, you can you can use any method that you want, but this is a good one. If this works, then that's good. You might wonder like what point is close enough, but any tiny positive number and tiny positive number is going to. Um, what's the practical use of finding maxes and mins? What is the what's the practical use of finding maxes and mins? Well, okay, this is a good question. So, is there anything in your life that you wish to maximize? Happiness. happiness. Good. Yeah, and your happiness is a function of several things. Perhaps are there? Can you tell me a couple of things that contribute to your happiness? Amount of sleep you get. Okay, that maybe the more you get, maybe the more your happiness goes up. Can you tell me something that contributes negatively to your happiness? Stress. Stress. Yeah, okay. So maybe your happiness is a function of two things sleep and stress. Probably a function of more things, but in math we like to simplify our things till we can analyze them. So in that case, your happiness is a function of two variables sleep and stress. And you, perhaps it looks like some sort of surface and you wish to find a maximum. Maybe a local maximum, or maybe a global maximum. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. So this would be one reason. Yeah. Um, should we only use the method on the right once we realize that one, the one on the left doesn't work for whatever we to use? Oh, you can use either method. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome to use <laughs> the one on the right instead of the second derivative test. It works. Yep. It always works. Okay, um, as our last thing, let's do a three-dimensional one.
also let's consider the function let's consider the function f of x, y, z is um, x, y plus x, z plus 2 y, z and then let's do minus 1 over x okay so if we take the gradient of f of x, y, z take the partial derivative with respect to each thing we will get like uh, y plus z plus 1 over x squared and then with respect to y we would get x plus 2z and with respect to z we get like x plus 2y and then if we set this equal to 0, 0, 0 and solve we would get as it turns out if you were to do this you would get 1 negative half negative half as the only critical point So let's classify it. So that was our first part, find the critical points, and then let's classify them. Um, the Hessian matrix of this is, has only got one variable in it, so 2 over x cubed, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 2, 2, 0. So the Hessian evaluated at 1, neg half, neg half is, well, 2. 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 2, 2, 0. Okay. And now, to f now you want to find eigenvalues of these things, of this thing, and see if they're positive or negative or 0 or what. So you would solve determinant of this, subtract lambda along the diagonal, equals 0. And it turns out that you get lambda is negative 2, negative 2, and 2. So what do you think? Subtle. So that tells us our point one, negative a half, negative a half is a saddle. Um, in my last minute and a half, I'll just say that um, if you're looking at a function of two variables, f of x, y, calling a point a saddle makes a lot of sense because <coughs> literally your surface looks like a saddle. There are points that are higher and there are points that are lower. But suppose you have a function of three variables like this. What does it mean? Well, I like to think of a function of three variables as like giving you the temperature at a point in space. So maybe our critical point, one, negative one half, negative one half is like right here at the end of my finger. It just means that there are two directions where if you go in those directions, it gets colder because the eigenvalues are negative. And then there's one direction where if you go in that direction, the temperature gets warmer. So it's a saddle, but it's sort of like a metaphor. That's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.